Today in our midst, we have two legends on our show. It is my personal honor to have Dr. C.H. Vasant Kumar, President-Elect of Research Society for Diabetes in India, which is known as RSSDI, which is also the Asia's largest professional body with over 8,500 members, which was founded in 1972. But now it's close to five decades of service in the di diabetes. Not only uh, Dr. Vasant Kumar is a, a, a very senior or renowned physician, but he's also an active philanthropist. He has founded Diabetes and Youth Society, supporting type 1 diabetes uh, children in underprivileged uh, societies since 1999. Dr. Vasant Kumar has done extensive research on type 1 diabetes in children and endocrinological disorders. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Vasant, and the mic is over. Thank you for giving me this great opportunity. So first of all, before uh, we start interacting with each other, it would be my privilege to mention a few words about this distinguished colleague of ours, who is now the president-elect of American Diabetes Association. And uh, it's my pleasure to tell some a few important things about Professor Guillermo. He is presently is the professor of medicine in the division of endocrinology and also director of diabetes and endocrinology section at Grady Memorial Hospital, Atlanta, Georgia, States of the United States. I have found him a very a unique uh, person. He is a professor. He is a teacher. He is a researcher. He is a social activist. And now, of course, he is the president elect of American Diabetes Association, which is not only the world's largest body but is also a body that has been guiding force for diabetes care all over the world. So, and if I have to tell you a few things about Dr. Guillermo and the wonderful work that he has been doing, and I'm so surprised, one individual receiving so many awards from so many national scientific bodies of the United States, as well as other international bodies. And then in the number of papers, beyond 300 research papers, articles that he has published and has been publishing relentlessly for the last many decades. And also, I must tell you, particularly I was thrilled to see his work that he's doing for the minority people suffering from diabetes in the United States of America. Minorities like maybe African-Americans or Latinos, he has always extended his hand of help and tried to create a better awareness and also see that they are better controlled. Let's know how he's doing it. And uh, so it's my proud privilege that today I am able to introduce to all of you person none other than Dr. Guillermo Umperes. Thank you for having us with us on this show, Dr. Umperes. My pleasure, Dr. Kumar. You're so kind. It's for me a real honor to be with you. And it's so interesting, two president-elect, and I hope that next year that we're going to be running the presidency, we can work together and join our societies. That, that would be absolutely fantastic. It's wonderful. Actually, it's wonderful. You know, when I start knowing about you and trying to learn about you, it was a great experience to me to find and hear about a colleague like you who is doing different kinds of work, not just the science, not just the research, not just teaching and beyond that. So we are really thrilled. When I was looking at your curriculum, when I was wondering where you did your basic degree, the medical school, the name of the city, I was not aware. So when I Googled it, I found that where it is, I know your place. So then I started wondering. So you had your basic medical education, your early childhood in a different country, in a different culture. Then you moved on to the US. It must have been very challenging. So generally, people would definitely like to know, Dr. Galerio, something about your background, your childhood, your early education, whatever you would like to tell us. This evening. Yeah, I, I was born in, in a city in Ecuador. The name is Guayaquil. Mm -hmm. um, I did my high school and went to university together uh, with a group of friends. There were five of us who were challenging each other on a daily basis. We could do better. The five of us came to the United States. I went back. I mean, I trained at Emory University, my internship, residency, fellowship, and stayed a little as a teacher there at Emory University, but I always wanted to go back and give back to my country. So I went back to Ecuador. I stayed there for three years. It, it was so close and so difficult to become a professor at the university at that time. So when I applied for the third time and I was denied to be 
in space in the university and say, okay, well, I go back to the United States. <laughs> so uh, I went back to, to Emory because I had an offer to go back anytime I wanted to. So I went back and I'm, I'm, in 1992, mm -hmm. uh, I was given the position of assistant professor with a one page contract. It says just take care of patients at Grady, that is the community hospital where poor people, indigent people go and take care of them the, and the diabetes from. So I went there. I didn't know much about how to run a hospital, a, a section in the hospital, but I, I did learn. And my job this reason it was to do research, to yes. do patient care and to teach the residents and fellows. So I, it has been a blessing to be there. You know, after I couldn't stay in my country. That's wonderful. I mean, back home, were you taught in Spanish? Yeah. Back in your country? Yeah, I, I speak Spanish. That's my native language, yeah. So, was, was it any difficult to shift to English when you were in USA? Oh, I still have a broken English, so I'm still trying to learn the language, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but I can write better than I can speak, I believe. It's yeah, English. that's wonderful. Yeah, and... But, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that, at least in Atlanta, Georgia, it's a very open society and I was welcome. And, and for example, in my unit, uh, we have people from all over the world. We have two doctors from India. We have doctors from Latin America. We have doctors from Iran. And we have doctors from all over the place. Mm -hmm. I it's see. Uh, uh, something that... It, you may not know is that in internal medicine, we, you know, there's a lot of international people, but in subspecialties, especially in endocrinology, more than half of the endocrinologists in the United States are foreign doctors. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they, they, they received the basic degree in some other country. And yeah. They and they go and... And we'd go and do the whole training. That's right. We'll repeat the internal medicine or they do the internal medicine. Then they do the fellowship. But there is a big difference. When yeah. you go, if you go to school in the United States, the average debt and yeah. loans that they have to pay is about $200,000. So when they finish their training, they have to pay back that amount of money. So they don't stay at the university that pays less than in private practice. Yeah. So... Uh, but international medical graduates, we have the privileges to go to uh, go to or come to the state with no loans, no debts to pay back. So we can easily stay for three more years or two more years. I did three years of training. So, so we I think that we love the science more than many Americans. We want to do better. We want to give back to humanity what we receive as a blessing. I believe. Yeah, that's wonderful. I fully agree with you. And um, it's, it's really interesting that obviously you've been associated with ADA for probably a few decades to reach yeah. this position as uh, the president-elect for medicine and science. And uh, so looking at it now, during this pandemic time, uh, how was the situation? How was your personal yeah. feeling? So, yes. so we learned about the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, the first news was at the beginning of February. Uh, in March 8th, the university closed down the clinics and closed down activities, uh, except for those who were dealing with patients in the hospitals. The other thing that they didn't close was research, but only allowed research in COVID. So we were closed for a couple of months. We started doing virtual clinics. But at the beginning, we, did, we never did virtual clinics. That's for telephone calls or or through computers or uh, tables. And, but we rapidly in, in incorporated the telemedicine uh, and we reopened slowly in-person clinics somewhere in the month of June, July. We always saw the emergencies. The hospital were open, but most of the people that were in the hospital was, uh, were, were COVID patients. The research was closed. We didn't, we were able to follow patients by telephone, those who were included, and we did a modification to the, in, to the IRB. So to, to be able to call the patient and say, how are you doing? Make sure that you take your medicine. But it was really a, a big drop in our incomes and how we would see patients. 
we we were able to start doing clinics in in person somewhere yeah. about in the fall so so about seven months ago six months ago now we are fully reopened uh, we got the vaccines most of the doctors got the vaccine at the in december yes. the first dose in december now 98 percent of the doctors have received the vaccine uh, it's still challenging that about 30 percent of our staff has refused to take the vaccine yeah. uh, they they don't feel like it, this this is something for them and despite the fact that we push them very hard to take the vaccine. The way that the dean and the president of the university says, okay, we cannot force you to take the vaccine, but if you are not vaccinated, you have to get a COVID test every week. So if you have to get that thing in your nose every week, I'm, I'm sure that's going to push them, just give me the vaccine. The other thing that we have done is that we close the, for the medical students, they close the classrooms and we, very few classrooms are open. We're going to reopen this fall, and I think in the month of August, every student needs to be vaccinated before they can attend classes. Teachers, doctors are not, a, not may, cannot be mandated, but they have to get the vaccine test every week or every other week just to be sure that they, they are okay. But the silver lining of all of this is that we were at the university, we were in position number 18, 19 of NIH grant money, the government federal grant money for grants and research. We are dropped now to number 13 in the country. So it has been a tremendous amount of income with COVID research that we have able to do that because I, we are close to the CDC. We, we, Emory University and the Center for Disease Control are together in the same land. That's great. I know yeah. it has been a very challenging time to everyone. What, 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 what has been your experience? It has almost been the same. A few similar, a uh, few things which could be different is that the challenges are that, uh, for example, if you look at the diabetic patients in India during this all of the pandemic time, especially if they're living in smaller towns, rural areas, they have no way that they could have had any monitoring of their diabetes. So they were just taking the medication, whatever they had hands on. And the worst times were if they contacted COVID. That was the, the, the worst time for them and for the clinicians managing them. So they, they used to come with very high blood glucose values. It was a huge challenge. Coupled with that, most of them developed complications in the second week. And invariably, as you know, like Guillermo, they were mostly on steroids, high dose of steroids, and diabetes only became worse. So... Uh, in the recent pandemic, the, the last stage of pandemic, uh, we have started seeing uh, some peculiar situations like uh, uh, patients developed uh, uh, some of the mycotic infections, uh, which became very severe, especially in diabetes patients. So, uh, it was fatal in some cases. So that's one of the recent challenges that are faced by diabetics uh, with COVID infection. And I'm sure the situation would be similar in you in your place, but here the mycotic infections are one which uh, took on us and uh, you know, suddenly uh, we needed medication like amphotericin, posaconazole, which was hardly being used in the past times. So suddenly imagine that we need to make millions of doses of them available in the country. So that was a huge challenge now. Slowly uh, we are coming over that situation. The numbers have come down in India now. It's about 45 to 50,000, considering 1.3 billion population in India. So we are on the way to, on the path of uh, improvement. That's what is happening. And Dr. Guillermo, now that uh, we know ADA, it's an American Diabetes Association, but we have to accept that you, your organization is a world leader, whether in forming, whether creating the research, creating the science and transmitting it to the rest of the world by way of guidelines and so many times. A guy like me sometimes used to be critical of uh, ADA guidelines. When somebody used to, because I am sharing from my heart, when, when some of my juniors asked me, should we follow ADA guidelines? I would always say, be careful. I mean, ADA guidelines are meant on some, some standards. You just think where you are, what kind of patient you are, and just try to transform that. But one great credit that later I learned is that you being in America, you have people from different racial backgrounds 
like you yourself has been working for Latinos, I have seen African Americans. So one thing that is interesting is now you are looking at people from different racial backgrounds. That means, uh, should I say that USA itself is like a mini world, you have people from different races. That really helps us because you are using your wisdom in managing people, not just Caucasians, but also Africans, Asians, South Asians, and Latinos. So we started understanding you more now. And an organization like RSSDI, we definitely respect ADA. We look at it very critically and see how we can sometimes alter it for the local benefits and try to take the advantage of uh, the great work done by your organization. Uh, I would like to hear from you, uh, your thoughts on this. Yeah, so, so the ADA, the mission of the ADA is to improve the life of people with diabetes. Hopefully one day find the cure of diabetes. Uh, we have not been able to find the cure despite, you know, decades of research and trying. And I don't think that cure is going to be in the, is going to be possible for most people with diabetes. And I think that the ADA, we fund research. Currently we have like 127 grantees or people who have grants uh, that we do it every year. This year we focus on diversity in minority patients, how to improve the life of minority patients. Uh, the other thing that the ADA does is to, we go to the, talk to the politicians and trying to improve the life, for example, the cost of medicine uh, uh, that is extremely high. Uh, and we're working with them to try to modify and change the laws and push the industry to cut prices. The other thing that we do is publish what we call the standard of care. The standard of care has right now 15 different chapters. And it goes from type of diagnosis, what is diabetes, goes to interventions like dietary, nutrition, medications, uh, complications, in hospital management, uh, the elderly, the older adults. And what we're trying to do is to put guidelines. Now, these are just suggestions. They need to be adopted for every society in the world. So we, we use, for example, in the last few years, we still consider metformin to be the number one agent for most people. But now we know that we have medications that are able to reduce cardiovascular mortality and renal complications, kidney complications in patients with diabetes. So we're pushing for these new drugs like GLP-1 or SGLT-2 that have been shown to be very effective. We recognize they are more expensive but we're trying to more expensive compared to sulfonylureas, for example. Uh, and, but, but we believe that hypoglycemia is still very common in patients with, with diabetes. And hypoglycemia has been associated with increased hospital admissions, uh, neurological complications, and maybe cardiovascular events. So we're shifting, uh, but we recognize that uh, they are very inexpensive and they're still utilized in about 20% of our patients in America. We meet for the standard of care every other week, starting in the month of March, and we finish in September, and it's published every January. And we review every single line, every single reference to make sure that it's up to date and include references that are new. And, and, and I think this is the major contribution in education and in patient care of the ADA is the ability to to produce this standard of care that I think is there not only for America, but from all over the world. So according to you, the SGLT2 inhibitors are in the current use. They are definitely very promising from the point of view, as you mentioned by you, because of cardiovascular advantage, as well as the renal, should I say, protection, or use it at a time where you can save the kidneys. And metformin is still being used uh, as a first line. Are, are you looking at... Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are probably uh, as a second line drug or a combination of SGLT2 metformin, even during the first time itself, when somebody comes to us, typically like in India with high HbA1c7. Yeah. And uh, we, this is something that we discuss several times a year. And there is many people who think that metformin should continue to be, but there are other says that maybe the other drugs may have an advantage because metformin doesn't have renal protection, it, besides the fact that you improve hemoglobin A1C, 
but HGLT2 and GLP1 has more rapid effects. Now, uh, you are correctly uh, correct in saying that maybe the combination of metformin and HGLT2 should be studied from the beginning. In, in this week, and I think that it's tomorrow afternoon, they're going to be presented the study that is called GRAGE, G-R-A-G-E. This is a study that cost the government $100 million. And it's going to take the patients who are newly diagnosed or recently diagnosed who are in metformin. And it's going to be metformin with placebo, metformin with sulfonylurea, metformin with the DPP4 cetacliptin, metformin and liraglutide and metformin and insulin to see which one of them and they have been followed for several years, which one of them has better glycemic control, has better function of better cells and less complications. Unfortunately, that study did not include an SGLT2. So okay. uh, that is a major deficiency of that study in the way that SGLT2s now are commonly used and being shown to be very protective for the heart and the kidneys. Now saying that, uh, two weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a paper that is called trend in medication use in the United States. And SGLT2s and GLP-1 together, the last time they got information was 2018, is utilizing less than 10% of the patients, 10%. Where young people, Blacks, Latinos using less than Caucasians. And of course, we have a significant number of people here who do not have insurance. And these medications are quite, quite expensive. So in your country, they are expensive, but most people can have access, that's right. Uh, here, uh, the cost of SGLT2 is about two or $300 a month. Yeah. Uh, and look, most people cannot pay two or $300 for a single medicine. Uh, yes. So uh, that's why they're not highly utilized. So, so cost still a very barrier to inpatient care with diabetes in the United States. Absolutely, absolutely. But you also have challenges. I mean, although being perhaps the richest country, you, you do have people who may not really afford better care, especially I know you're working for the minority. What are the challenges there that you see in your own country? Because I, have, I, have, I cannot visualize that myself. So in, with respect to the pandemic, there are states, especially in the south of the United States, that 30-40% of the population did not take the vaccine. They don't believe that. Uh, in the North, especially in the Northeast and in the West, in California, there are 90% of people have taken the vaccine. So there's a completely different, has become very political thing that they don't want to wear masks, they don't want to get the vaccine. And with respect to diabetes, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge is cost of the medications. The second biggest is that not everybody has insurance. So the very, very poor, and the, those who have incomes uh, that can take insurance are very protected. For example, in our hospital, in our hospital, we provide medication for a really reduced cost. And we spend over $20 million a year in, in buying medicine for the, those who are very poor. So, and, and then the government has two types of insurance, has something that is called Medicare and the other called Medicaid. So Medicare is for older adults. Over the age of 65, you can, uh, you can buy insurance through Medicare. And, and that is not that expensive. The, in Medicaid for the poor, uh, but there are somewhere around 30 or 40 million people in this country who do not have insurance. And that is a big challenge for us. How do you manage these patients? So we still use the medications who are very cheap by the fact that, that maybe they, don't, they, they would benefit from other more expensive medicines, but that's reality. That's and exactly. the third is the education, that's right. I mean, we have uh, not as many, you have 70 million people in India with diabetes, I believe. We have 30 million people, 34 million people with diabetes in this country, but we don't, uh, uh, we don't have enough diabetes specialists to take care of them. So you have a similar challenge like in India, if you see, sometimes I do compare your minority population, like the Africans or Latinos, typically lower middle class, cannot afford better treatment, but they're obese, very poor lifestyle. We are seeing it back in India now. The so-called poor people living in urban slums, they are getting diabetes at a young age. They are obese. They do not have good access to any good health care, nor they well-educated. 
and that kind of a population is going up in India. But when I see such obese people back in your country, for example, an African American who is almost sometimes right on the street, I think of the people back in India in the urban slums. A similar situation, and it's a, it's a it's very paradoxical seeing a situation in a developing country and a similar situation in a highly developed uh, country. It, yeah, and, and if you look at the prevalence of obesity in African-Americans in female is 42% have a BMI greater than 30 and 38% in male. And it's predicted in a paper published in the New England of last year that for the year 2030, so eight years from now, about 50% of the populations in this country will have a BMI greater than 30. So 50%, half of the people in America is, pre is predicted they're going to be obese. So what is that? Uh, first is that 30 years ago, the government uh, suggested that, you know, cereals and corns and it's good for your health. Stay away from eggs, stay away from meat, steaks, meat, meat uh, be, trying to reduce cholesterol and that has increased ca caloric intake. We don't move. And if you compare the poor people, uh, they have to work one or two jobs. Uh, so a, a female or a man goes to work, comes back around seven, eight o'clock at night, and it's hard to do exercise. If you have two jobs to take care, uh, or, or, or you have to take care of your kids, uh, cook, and take care of your family, it, it's very little time to do physical activity. High uh, income they have time. The other way is that the other poor people usually have lower level of education, right? And, and of course, the selection of meals that you have, if you don't have enough money, then you're going to go for the cheap ones. That's right. You're going to go for the rice and things that have high caloric intake uh, instead of more vegetable, more fruits that cost more. I don't think that in India it's a problem to have vegetables and fruits. Uh, but in this country, if you go to, go to the section of fruit, uh, vegetable, they're more expensive than to have beans and rice. That's right. And that's I think that is the, the main problem that we have. Fifty percent of Americans are destined to become obese in the next ten to twenty years. That's a very sad situation. I don't know what uh, a larger role that uh, the medical profession can play in this. I know we've been talking about lifestyle modification each time to our colleagues in all of our guidelines worldwide. America, India, but are we somewhere failing? And you also told me the reasons for it. I understand. But should we do something beyond that, what we have been doing now? Will that be one challenge? Uh, I thought it's a challenge for me in India. How do you look at this aspect? You are correct. That's right. We realize, and now with the American Diabetes Association meeting that is going on during the next three days, there are several presentations about the reality of diabetes prevention. And one of the lectures that I learned that I heard yesterday was diabetes prevention in low income countries. Uh, the same challenge that we have in America. People, it's hard to keep the weight down. Most of us will go on a diet and lose weight and regain the weight. Away. There are medications that produce weight loss, but they have side effects. So they're not good for prevention. So I think the only way to fight obesity is prevention of prevention of become obese. When you are obese, you are always destined to, to, to have problems with weight. So in this country, we have several programs that now goes to the uh, kids and children to elementary school to first let them know. And, it, and this is something that comes since President Obama and Michelle Obama led those programs to go to school and implement that first educate the children that obesity is not healthy. Second, selection of meals. Uh, in, in public schools, you cannot buy sodas with calories. Uh, increase the consumption of fruits in school because they get meals in school, that's right? So, uh, and also educate the, the teachers. The, because when you're a kid, you spend, at the time that you're awake in a day, half of the time you spend in school, more than half of the time. So they have contact with teachers. So. We're including teachers and educators uh, with respect to meals and, and the importance of doing exercise. The only way to fight the, 
obesity is with prevention of become obesity. When you are obese and you have diabetes, it's very hard. And many, many patients develop diabetes when they are in the 50s, 60s. So if you have not done exercise when you are age 50 or 60, it's very hard to start running or jogging or playing tennis when you are 60 years of age. That's right. So, so it is a big challenge that we have all around the world. What is going to happen with diabetes? And what is going to happen with pre-diabetes? We have 80 millions in this country. So, and of course, India has much, much larger number of patients with diabetes and pre-diabetes. And, yeah. and it's, it's my understanding, you develop diabetes at a much lower BMI that you, we do in America, that's right. True, sir. As you mentioned, Cash Tim Yang work on preventing childhood obesity. As you said, I think it's one of the most important steps I think people all over the world have to take. I think we still need to sensitize our own professional colleagues on these aspects that you very rightly mentioned, apart from the drug therapy. Prevention is so important. I'm so happy that you are focusing on these issues. Lastly, just wanted to also share some of your thoughts about technology. Technology has been going so high that uh, we are able to provide a few things which we never thought of. And you know, you are interested in beta cell function, you are working on it. I've read uh, your article on management of hypertension, I mean, that hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's down to earth practical aspects is one thing that I liked. So coming back to the technology, uh, what do you think of the future of the latest technology? And uh, how do we translate that to many people? I yeah. can find it difficult. Yeah. The, so technology and diabetes have become, during the past decade, a, a hot thing. So first, a continuous glucose monitoring now are used widely. And now the Medicare is accepting to use in this country for those who are older adults on insulin uh, to use Medicare and they can get the, the CGMs, continuous glucose monitoring. Um, in the hospital, we have included, and now we're doing several studies. Uh, when, you, when patients are hospitalized, they get tested three or four times a day. The, the question would be, can you place a CGM and don't have to be preconfingers? fingers? We have several, several studies. And now we're doing a study for the Food and Drug Administration to the FDA to see if we can replace finger sticks by CGM when patients are hospitalized. Not for everybody, but for those who are on high doses of insulin, those with type 1 diabetes, those with kidney failure. And the, I don't know if it's going to, what, what those studies are going to show, but we're doing them now. The cost has come down significantly for the CGM. And, and maybe, maybe that's the, if you ask me, you want to take a CGM in your abdomen and your arm instead of being pricking finger for seven days, three, four times a day, maybe I would say, give me that little thing. That's right. The other thing is that we're going to, we are now able to transmit the, the, from the CGM readings all the way to the nurse stations. So in the nurse station, we have a, a screen. We have an alarm when the glucose is low. So when the glucose drops below 80, 85, the nurse has to go to the room, prick the fingers, and give you some more and juice and crackers and prevent the drop to 60, 50, 40 that has complications. So the other uh, technology like, like pumps, insulin pumps is increasing, but unfortunately only 30% of patients with type one are on pumps because the cost is high. And, uh, and, 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 and you have to have insurance to be able to get it. Uh, those who have Medicaid, the poor people, it's always a challenge. And you spend a lot of time trying to get pre-approval for this insurance. The doctors just prefer to give this, the just injections. The other is the closed loop. Uh, so now we are doing the studies that we have a pump connected to a CGM or CGM connected to the pump and then it's hands-free. And there are three companies now working on this. But again, this is going to be for selective people who have insurance for being able to to, to use them, not for patients with type two diabetes. It's too complicated. So, uh, so those are the three technologies. And finally, something that I think is going to be the future for many, many patients with type one and type two diabetes is what we call smart pens. So smart pens are a pen, that, like, a, like, like a pen, like an injector that you charge, they change the cartridge and the pen connects to 
and a smartphone or connect to a device that if you don't take the insulin, it will remind you. The other thing that it, tra it, it, it tracks the, the amount of insulin that you take. The other thing is that because you have a CGM, you, it tells you, for example, according to the glucose, how much insulin you have to take before meals. So I think that smart pens is something that is coming. I'm very eager to increase the utilization of them. But again, you have to get, they're expensive and you have to get pre-approval to use these devices. So, so, but for those who can use it, I think that I would not be surprised that in the next three to five years, a large portion of the population will be on smart pens if they're used in smart. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm glad you dealt with the technology, the latest ones, whether continuous glucose monitoring or closed loop system or the smart pens that you mentioned. Even in India, uh, as you mentioned, CGMs have, are not any more too expensive. So some of the people can afford it. And uh, we have many professional specialists who are able to handle the situation. But when it comes to pumps, as you mentioned, even uh, not even 5% of type 1 diabetic in India can afford to have a pump who really need them. Otherwise, oh, that's the... So actually, that's wonderful. I, I can see the, the humane part of you in the present president-elect of ADA, which is very important as a scientist. As somebody said, you need to balance the heart and brain. So a good scientist, a good human being, so you understand the necessities of your society and world at large. And I'm sure during the coming years, with your leadership, with the team, the board, wonderful people that you have, I'm sure you are going to do much more and we in back in India, let's see how uh, sometimes we can, I won't say learn from each other, maybe sometimes. And then we do have this uh, Research Society Diabetes scientific meetings. I would love to invite you to be a special guest, either during the virtual meetings. In the coming times, whenever things improve, we would like you to be in India to attend one of these Huge scientific meetings, 10,000 people, not as big as ADA, but wonderful meeting people. So, yeah, I, I, I'll be delighted to attend. And more importantly, I, I hope that we continue to communicate and both of our societies can work together on behalf of our patient with diabetes. Wonderful. Right? Because when, when we care as human beings, as doctors dedicated to the care of patients with diabetes, is to improve their life. Uh, I don't think we're going to see cure in our life, in the, maybe in the future, but, but we're not going to see cure. We only have to improve the life of people with diabetes, provide them with support and the knowledge to doctors or professionals who take care of them. And I would be delighted. I already accept your invitation anytime, Wonderful. Uh, whenever, whenever we meet in, in we have person. To. Yeah. We have to take this forward. We need to do more, much more things. I, and I wish you all the best. And thank you so much for being with us, I would say, this evening in India with us. And uh, we learned so many things. We learned about you and we learned so many things. And uh, we are looking forward to work together. And uh, thank you so much. If there are any more things, our team, are you at the back end? Why don't you come? Yes, yes. Uh, it was wonderful, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Amperez and Dr. Vasant Kumar. And uh, I think one line uh, wishing uh, all the doctors across uh, India on the Doctor's Day when it's going to play it, uh, I think uh, uh, just one simple uh, line from Dr. Amperez uh, regarding uh, uh, medicine or something that they can say that can inspire the Indian doctors. Can we have a line, doctor, on wishing them on the uh, Doctor's Day? Uh, be compassionate. Uh, <laughs> never give up. Uh, we're going to have challenges, and we have challenges every day. Uh, but be positive. Keep a positive mind. Life would be good if we keep a positive mind. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Professor Amperez, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vasan Kumar. Uh, it was exciting having you both, uh, the legends of medicine, and that is like the East meeting the West. And I hope to see you in future uh, Indian meetings as well, uh, Professor Amperez. And I thank you from the uh, from the whole team of Omnicurus and as well as uh, uh, from RSSD, I, all the members for actually joining and coming for this session. It was really, really helpful. We know that you are crunch first time, and we are actually mentioned it uh, in our brief that uh, uh, that the uh, Professor Amperes will have back-to-back -back meetings and we have to be crisp and stop on time. And we have ensured that, Doctor. 
uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ramkar. Thank you, thank you Dr. And it's my pleasure, Dr. Kumar, and hope that I give you a hug. This, this, this is what we say, Gulayar Namaste. It's also, Namaste. It's also wishing and also being grateful to you yeah. for spending Namaste. your valuable time. Thank you.